Welcome to this Archive of Iowa Broadcasting interview. Today is Tuesday, October the 26th, 2021. I am Paul Yeager and joined by longtime Iowa fixture on many, many televisions, John Bachman, KGAN, WHO is where he retired a few years ago. And John joins us in retirement now. And, and, and John, when you, you think about your history from where you started to where you ended up, did your career go as you thought it would go? Uh, you know, I think when I was young, I had visions of being a network anchor or something like that. I think most young people do. Um, I was not certain I was going to get into broadcasting because I was a son of a pastor, college president, and felt like the church was going to perhaps be part of my life. So I kind of had a fork in the road at a point where I had experienced some of both, and went into broadcasting. And then I think probably like most young people, you, you track yourself as high as you possibly could go. But when I uh, was in one of the larger markets in Chicago, I got firsthand experience of what network life is really like. And it's very, very, not only is it tense and anxious filled, but you make a lot of sacrifices with your family life. And for me, family was really important. So I, I kind of re-evaluated what my future was gonna be. Um, that was at WMAQ in Chicago, and it was a great experience for many, many reasons. But I think that, that really helped structure the rest of my career. I made some choices there that I probably didn't make when I was younger. <laughs> well, I, I will get to WMAQ. Let's start with your father. You're the son of a preacher man, son of the president yep. at Wartburg College. You're a Waverly Shell Rock graduate. So the church is calling you first. Is that what I'm, I've am i read about you? Yeah, I, I, think, I think at first, uh, I don't know that I had a calling, but I certainly had the culture around me and felt that faith was important in anybody's life. And so that was a natural possible vocation. And my dad kind of encouraged me to think about it. Um, although he didn't discourage me when I started in broadcasting in my college summers, I was over at KDTH radio in Dubuque with a great Bob Gribner, um, got some great experience. I think it was Gordy Kilgore was in the news department, some great Iowa broadcasters over there. Uh, and then I kind of moved up in summer jobs and got into some television experience. That was while I was still in college and then while I was in seminary. I was in seminary up in St. Paul at Luther Seminary for a year, and then I studied abroad for a year. And during that whole time, I was also doing broadcasting. So I hadn't had to make a decision yet. <laughs> and it was around uh, 72 when I, I'd finally made a decision. Was that a hard decision? You know, it wasn't because I found that I loved broadcasting and I knew that it wouldn't be fair to go into the church with that thought and that experience um, guiding my love. So um, what I thought down the road was maybe I can use some of the training that I've had to kind of relate the two. It seems kind of odd to think that broadcasting and uh, religion would have necessarily an interrelation, uh, but I tried to do that in, in my career. College in Minnesota, if I remember correctly. Yes. St. Olaf, uh, good Norwegian college. <laughs> Norwegian Lutheran college. Let's get that right. And, and prepared me for a Luther seminary. Yeah. And uh, if I remember correctly, you at one time were listed on, uh, on the Wikipedia page of famous Lutherans. Is that accurate? Oh, that can't be. <laughs> you know, there was, there was a John Bachman minister who um, was an ornithologist too. And he was on Wikipedia for years and years. Then my dad was a John Bachman who was mm -hmm. at Bird College. And so, and now, yeah. now there's John Bachman in uh, Jacksonville. He's an anchor, my son. And there's a John Bachman uh, with, uh, what's the 
He's with one of the conservative media outlets. I believe there's a Newsmax. Yes. And that's no relation? That's no relation. Your they son knew, is in Jacksonville. They actually knew each other in uh, Atlanta. Did your son have any thoughts of like your father or like you with your father thinking about that business? Did, did your son dabble in something else? And then he got drawn mm -hmm. back into broadcasting. He did. He did. He was pre-med and uh, at St. Olaf. And, and I think he, he really was sincere about that, but he got a couple of opportunities to do some sports videos. And like me, he kind of fell in love with it. He got the disease and then I helped him uh, get some internships and told him, you know, if you're going to make it in this business, you got to do whatever they ask and then some more. And he translated that uh, internship into some job offers and from there moved up very quickly. Uh, you, when you started, um, what was the first job? Full-time job? The first, uh, first full-time job uh, was in Cedar Rapids at WMT. And what a great first time job. This was 1972. I came in to co-anchor with Dave Shea. Um, we had Ron Gonder in sports and Conrad was, you know, the most famous weatherman in Iowa. It was like made for success. I, I was dropped in. I could not fail. We had unbelievable ratings and so that was that was my introduction to broadcasting full time. I thought, gee, this is pretty easy. <laughs> In fact, Paul, I would suggest that you go back sometime. It, it ought to be possible. I've never done this, but you ought to go back, find a rating book from that era when WMT had WMT AM as well. It wasn't, you know, KGAM. Uh, Grant Price did not develop. KWWL right away when he left WMT. It took, you know, a couple of years. So there wasn't a whole lot of competition. It would be interesting to know what the ratings were in 1972-73 at six o'clock and 10 o'clock and compare that to the ratings, I would say, of WMAQ in Chicago today. A minuscule audience compared to Chicago audience, but in terms of how broadcasting has changed and been fragmented, the size of the audience at WMT might have been quite close to what the audience is for local news in Chicago today. Well, I don't think anybody's ever done that. No, and the options, I mean, you have to think about the way television, as you said, not fragmented like it is today two, maybe three options. KCRG wasn't really a player at that time. Right. Uh, KWWL when Grant uh, went north. Uh, did Grant hire you at Cedar Rapids or had he left? He was there for a month or two. So he was, <laughs> I, you were one of his last hires? I came and he left. <laughs> yeah. He knew what to do. Exactly. <laughs> So you're sitting next to Conrad Johnson and Dave Shea and Ron Gonder. I mean, and, yep. you, and you say, oh, my gosh, how 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 fortunate you were. Those those are people that are on, you know, that it's a it's a tired phrase, the Mount Rushmore of Iowa broadcasting. But let's face right. it, those three are there. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And they were they couldn't have been nicer. Um, Dave had actually gone to Luther Seminary for a year. So and, and he'd been to St. Olaf's. I mean. We had to be the only anchor team in the entire nation, then or now, that <laughs> could tout that if you want to tout it. Yeah. Uh, but Conrad, you know, was open arms and Ron Gonder was funny as all get out. And so it was a great time. And um, the whole station enabled me to be successful. Um, I remember going out uh, to the rural areas and some of the people that would take me out there to introduce me to various groups. And then I did some visitations to, at churches around the area and got to know the whole audience pretty well. And so it was a, it was a combination of things, but it, it was pretty neat. Did you think that KG or WMT was going to be the only place or I mean, you we're still in that pre run up where you're thinking yeah, network. Right. So yeah, what was I'm, the plan at that point? Yeah, I'm still planning to move up. I mean, I loved it, but I thought, you know, uh, 
this is working out pretty well. I ought to be able to do this somewhere else, maybe. <laughs> you know, the, the ambition of youth. And how did that translate? What did you do next? Well, I got a job in Chicago. I mean, that was remarkable to go from, you know, what was then, I think Cedar Rapids then was close to 72, 73. I think it's fallen down, down to the 80s to the number, you know, three market in the country. And I, I got a job as weekend anchor and reporter in Chicago. And, uh, you know, it was, I was probably not ready yet for that size market. And so it was a bit of a struggle, uh, but it was, boy, what a wonderful experience. I mean, I met people like Jane Pauley, um, it, it, Tom Brokaw and those people. I got into contact with for the first time. And, and as I said earlier, I got, got to see what sacrifices are really made to be involved with networks and how much time is really devoted to your job. What year is this that you made the move? 74 to 7, 74 to 77, I was in Chicago. And so, I mean, you're not much more than 25 when you make that move, 26? Right. I was 26. Yeah. So a young guy with Iowa. I mean, when you say you didn't feel maybe quite prepared, what was it that didn't didn't click? I wasn't the reporter that I should have been. Um, and I looked like I was about 16. So, um, in fact, when I got my job at WMT, um, they, they did an audition and then they took me into the makeup room and they put powder in my hair um, to make me look a little older. And then they took me back out on the set, take a look at what it looked like and it looked like powder in my hair. Really. <laughs> So I, you know, I got that job and I got, I got the, um, the MAQ job because of my anchoring, but I was young and there were, there were some people at the network level that were ready to really focus more on the younger audience. WMAQ was number two to WLS. Um, Floyd Calber was the anchor and was an institution in Chicago. He was an old type of oracle type of anchor, and uh, I was more the conversational, younger type of approach. And I think they were looking for something like that. And then they hired Jane Pauley a year later, um, and she was more that same mold. So they were in the midst of some changes, but I just wasn't ready to be the one. What eventually happened was they, um, it's ironic because I felt like I wasn't the reporter that I should have been, what they did is they took me off the weekend um, as an anchor and said, you certainly can stay here as a reporter. And then down the road, maybe we'll do some other things. There had been a change in management as usually happens. (laughs) And so the general manager who had hired me and the news director who had hired me were gone. And so the new news director told me that I was going to be taken off. I struggled with it, but I really knew that having experienced now what network life was like, that I wanted to be an anchor in a local market. I didn't want to aim for the network level. And I wanted to have some time with family. We had son John had been born that first year in Chicago. We were already thinking, oh my gosh, here we are living downtown Chicago. What are we going to do? And that sort of thing. And at about that time, when the network told me that I was going to be a reporter five days a week and not anchor on Saturday and Sunday, um, WMT called up out of the blue and said, uh, you know, we'd love to have you come back. And I think they came, they came class, close to matching my salary in Chicago, which I had not been making before. And they said, Dave Shea wants to do some editorials now. We want you to, to anchor, be the main anchor. And so I did that. And it was probably, in terms of career resume, it was the mistake of my life. In terms of happiness and family future, it was great because it 
it solidified my idea about being an anchor in a local market. I enjoyed it. I was back doing it. And I, of course, knew I would enjoy WMT. But it was one of those things on a resume that you can never explain. Um, I might as well have been fired, you know. And, and why would you ever go back then to that size market when you're in the market at age 20, now 28? In Chicago, you just keep using that to uh, be with the network. And so that was uh, interesting to reflect back on, but I certainly don't regret it. So on the second tour at WMT, yeah. how long do you stay there? Uh, three years. Um, good years. I'm, I'm trying to think, you know, that that second time in Cedar Rapids, I was I was happy again, but I felt like, okay, I now know for sure. I think I can anchor in a larger market somewhere. We were still not covering the news the way I knew was possible now, having been at WMAQ. And so I was looking forward to a little more professionalism among reporters and producers and the like, as great as WMT was. But now it wasn't quite as strong as it had been, of course. Um, and I could take some of the blame for that. But, you know, Grant Price was building up Cape WL. And KCRG was doing some things. So it wasn't as easy as it had been. And then when I got an offer up in Minneapolis to go up there to the new NBC station, um, I went up there. It was WTCN then. It became CARE TV. How different is Minneapolis from, say, Chicago and Cedar Rapids? I'd say Minneapolis is closer to a Chicago, yeah, and I, I can't say for sure what it's like today. I should say then, even. I mean, then, but of course. And I think the biggest difference uh, was that in Chicago, you had the network bureau there, and you had three or four network reporters, and you had correspondents, and you had photographers. Uh, you had three-man crews. You had sound man, light man. <laughs> I mean, photographer, uh, the reporter, it was an extravaganza just to go out and cover a story. And of course, then, you know, it was filmed to begin with. So it was a whole different ballgame. But I do remember thinking when I got to WTCN, even though they were still a third rate station in Minneapolis, because they had been an independent station. And until Gannett bought WTCN, um, they, they struggled, but it was still, I could tell, um, felt a lot more, the market felt a lot more like Chicago had. And, and you know, when, well, I just wanted to add, you know, the different, I know we'll get into the difference between news then and news today, but you had a Chicago bureau with all of those resources. And nowadays you know, what does NBC have? One one correspondent for the entire Midwest or something? I mean, and and of course the correspondents were fighting for half hour space all around the country. There was one half hour newscast. Well, and now they might be on, they might do 90 seconds on the 530. They've been on MSNBC three times and there's a possibility CNBC needed them for, I mean, now you are with less people. Yes, yes. You do much more with less, which is the, the, the theme for our discussion about today's news and yeah. what's wrong. With it. But it's much, much more. You do much more with less. So, you know, I was concerned about being a correspondent those days. I can't imagine how taxing it is now. Well, I've heard stories, worked with people that have had worked at the network and you hear envelopes of cash was was common. Uh, when you'd roll into town with something, of, oh. you had to get a car, you you didn't have clothes, fine. You didn't have, here's an envelope of cash. And now they just kind of look at you like, you want to do what? No, you can't, you no. can't get another uh, disc to, to shoot that story. I, I mean, it's, I know that's a little extreme, but that's close. It is. And it was even not just the networks. When, when Gannett bought us at CARE, um, they, they actually, they started by naming us WUSA TV. Nobody remembers that, but 
for about nearly a year, I think we were WUSA TV after Gannett bought us, but then they bought a station in Washington and they decided they had to have WUSA in Washington. Right. So then we became care. But when Gannett bought us, um, they had unbelievable budgets and the news director would reward you with, okay, uh, John, you're a golfer. You've done a good job this week. Um, why don't you go out? Uh, Jack Nicholas is opening a new course. Uh, there's a press availability. You can go out and have some fun and then just come back with one or two stories or go cover. Um, it was the 10th anniversary of Walt Disney World in Florida. John, take your family and go down there and have fun and send, you know, send one report back, whatever a day. We'll take care of it all. I mean, that was the type of thing that was happening in broadcasting then. <laughs> what a joke compared to today. Your, your former coworker at your last station, Dave Price, and I still correspond quite often. Um, yeah. uh, and he just did a trip to the, the Mexican border uh, to cover Governor Reynolds. And I know the trip didn't sound anything like uh, what you just described. So uh, I think it was basically a rundown pickup truck and good luck if you can make it. And if you get back, just give us our 42 stories tomorrow. Uh, how long and what was the reason for uh, departing Minneapolis? Minneapolis, uh, when Gannett took over, I had had a primary um, anchor role. And they actually, when Gannett came in, they, they gave me a less important anchor role. They raised my salary, but which, you know, again, that would be unheard of today. Uh, and I, uh, I, I was the first to do the morning news, which is now very, very important. Um, morning news is probably as important as the evening news. At the time, it was still early on. It wasn't as important. And I felt like I wasn't making the impact in the community that I wanted to, but I, I, I stayed doing that for about three or four years. Um, I was in Minneapolis for seven years. And again, I was, I was thinking, you know, this isn't quite right. I'm not having the impact on the community I'd like to have. I'm still anchoring. I'm also doing some reporting, so that's good. I'm, I'm keeping my hand in it. Uh, but I kept my eyes open for possible leads, and that's when WHO reached out. And this is mid-80s, right? This mid was, to late 80s? Yeah, so this is uh, 80, um, 89. Yeah. So did you answer 80, on the first? 87. 87? Yeah. Did yeah. you answer the first call from them, or did you have to think about it a little bit? Um, you know, uh, I did answer the first call. I had to think about it and I think they had to think about it. There was kind of a dance there for about uh, six months or so. And then we came into Des Moines and it was all kind of, excuse me, under wraps and Barb, my wife actually had to go in and see the space. They didn't want to have me inside the building. So things again, you know, without the internet and everything, it was just beginning. Uh, communication was totally different then. You could have secrets, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 1989, who's the general manager, who's news director there uh, when you're hired? Uh, John, um, see now, I'm 73, so I'm, I'm having trouble with names. <laughs> um, I'm trying to remember. Um, oh, boy. Well, you had uh, several general managers and news directors, yeah. so it's, it's yeah. okay. No, but, well, I once made a list of all the news directors I'd had. And I think I had 25 <laughs> over my career. I tried to order them and, you know, the most successful, the, the, the wisest. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, now that's a list we got to see sometime. <laughs> that should be in the archives. <laughs> um, but Joe Lentz was in those years, those earlier years, was, an, uh, was probably the most outstanding general manager. Um, he was, he was really remarkable. And by 91, uh, we had a really successful um, run at KCCI for a number of reasons, for all kinds of reasons. 
but one of them was was management and commitment and the reporters that we had the experience that they had in the market and then came the floods of 93 so we were building in in 91 and uh, then by 93 um, we were on top of our game and so that that was a really rewarding time and i look back and i you know i i think of all kinds of people who were instrumental in that and i tried um once at an award ceremony as i was looking back i tried to get people to to think back to their mentors and the ones who had really helped them and i said you know while you're still in the business go and and talk to them and thank them uh because there'll come a time when you won't be able to do that anymore so don't wait to when you're old and get awards like i'm getting right now do it do it sooner and 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 really appreciate so i did that and now i can't remember their names so i can't remember their names uh first co-anchor in des moines was because kim kerrigan was there when in 93 but was she your first co-anchor then uh, uh in the evening casts not um okay you're you're taxing me again wow I, yeah sorry because i had uh i think i counted about 30 co-anchors in my career but kim kerrigan was certainly um the most influential and that was that same time she was the most influential in our success because um, she was there when we really made a run and became number one for a while um with kcci and that you know that was a great time because as you know working with a co-anchor is really critical you have to have real confidence in their ability because a lot of it is um just kind of dancing and you throw it to the other and then they throw it back to you election nights especially but you have to trust them to pick up on where you're going and and then vice versa they have to trust that you're going to be knowledgeable enough to understand the direction that they're headed and there are times during live coverage more than anything where where that really just becomes fundamental and if you're working with someone i had an anchor in minneapolis of all places who was just totally she was kind she was affable she was naive and unknowledgeable i don't know what courses she took in college but i started writing down you know examples of what she would throw at me and i mean for instance as an example i'm going off on a tangent here but i won't give you her name either this one i remember unfortunately <laughs> And so, so we had a story of Governor Tommy Thompson in Wisconsin offering the olive branch to the legislature. And so we come out of the video because he's trying to make amends with the legislature. And so the script said, offering an olive branch. And, <laughs> and this co-anchor turned to me and said, I didn't see an olive branch in that video one one night she asked me um is martin luther king related to martin luther i mean these were just basic unbelievable things that that could be thrown at you from an anchor that you don't know necessarily how to respond <laughs> and uh when you have the opposite of that uh it's really wonderful those would be moments that would live on and on and on on the internet age if there was YouTube at well, those points. Yes. Yes. Shall I tell you my most embarrassing moment that? Go ahead. Th this, it, I'm grateful that it wasn't, you know, the age of the internet because it, it just would have been, I think, I think actually Keith, uh, Keith may, might still have it somewhere. I'm not sure. But I'm throwing it to Keith for sports and he does two stories one on on Sean Johnson and and uh, one on Zach Johnson because both were in the news on a regular basis and he ends his sports cast with those two stories back to back so he throws it to me and I I say Keith how do you keep your Johnson straight 
and Keith, you know, is he's looking at me and, and he's such a great guy. He's not going to embarrass me. Uh, he's not going to laugh. But in the age of the internet, that would have perhaps ended my career. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, Keith Murphy, uh, I'm sure I just was listening to his radio show before we dialed in together. And they would probably have talked about that for a, a couple of days on the show had he responded a certain way. John, I want to go back to your co-anchor comment. You, you described it as dancing because chemistry with people that you are on screen with is extremely hard to we'll call fake if it's not genuine iowans specifically midwest in general can tell when two people probably don't get along Mm -hmm. how difficult is it to get along respect communicate and sit by someone for as long as you did um you know it, it it is a job, and so you, you make the most of it. Um, that one in Minneapolis was very difficult. It lasted for about two years. Um, I disagreed with how they had chosen her, but she was stunning and looks, and so that was the reason. But when you have people uh, that you really are simpatico with, and Aaron was great when I finished my career, um, and those kind of anchors. I mean, I did a little anchoring with Jane Pauley in Chicago. So, I mean, these people are so capable that it makes your job easier. And I've always felt like my strength in broadcasting was to make other people better. Um, And so I tried with everybody. Um, I really felt like that was kind of my calling. And and I was successful with some and not with others. Um, But, you know, Catherine Pritchard was with me for a number of years, and she was very capable. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lori Groves, she was very good. People don't know that Lori Groves is quite a good writer. And, uh, you know, she she had a little more of the good looks type of, I think, persona, but she was very, very good. I always like to hear from Lori. I I would hear from her on occasion in in her next endeavor after she left WHO. You mentioned KCCI a little bit there. Uh, Kevin Cooney and you were kind of the 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 generation of male anchors that uh, this market in Des Moines had had experienced for a number of years. Was Kevin Cooney a friend? And how do you have that relationship of you guys are competitors, but yet you're doing the same thing? Yeah, you know, I, I would say, yes, he's a friend. Uh, he, we're not close friends. We didn't spend a lot of time together. Um, he was gracious enough to come to my retirement party, and we spent a little time afterwards after I had retired. But And then I left Des Moines. Um, I decided that it would be good. We, we spent a couple years after I retired in Des Moines. But I thought it'd be good for Dan Winters to, you know, for me just to be gone, too. It might help not that he needed help but it it was a combination of me getting to warmer weather but also just I think a wise thing I know my dad felt like when you're when you're done being president of a college leave the town let the new president um, handle it Uh, but anyway uh, I had great respect for Kevin and I hope he had similar respect he was gracious on a number of times after the presidential debate he sent a very nice note um, I tried to send him some notes at, at times because he, he was just, you know, terrific, terrific. I think we ba- we we literally made each other better. Uh, and and you two would get some of the same assignments in the sense of uh, if a political a president or a candidate, a big time person right. called, likely they were picking. Well, are we going to go? Oh, is Bachman going to interview us, or is it going to be Cooney, or maybe it's going to be both? You both interviewed a lot of presidents. How did you view that call when you got it? Were you thinking about the viewer first, or is there a little of that competition of I got something that they don't? How did you view that? Oh, there, there's always a competition. If you're a newsman, you're you're hoping to get the best story. I mean, that's just the nature of the beast. Um, but it, it was always fair competition and never wanting to do anything under the table. We both uh, went to the White House on the day of the Oklahoma City bombing and interviewed Bill Clinton. Um, I went in a different, a little bit of a different direction because of my uh, faith background. 
with some of my questions. Um, that, that became very important to me, that interview with Bill Clinton. Uh, we, we had both flown out and I think we were on the same plane and uh, the bombing actually happened while we were in flight. So we arrive in Washington DC and, and are not sure that we're still gonna have an interview with Bill Clinton. Um, Clinton goes to the press room, addresses the nation tells him about the bombing and then doesn't take any questions and hands it over to Jana Reno. Again, Kevin and I are just, you know, I wonder, are we going to do this or not? We didn't hear, get word right away, but then we got word. We're going to the Roosevelt room and you are going to be able to interview Bill Clinton for, it was about 45 minutes. And so anyway, I took that opportunity to ask him on days like this, when you have a crisis like this, um, how hard is it to be president? And I know from what he had written that he had read Reinhold Niebuhr and was astute with some of the theology of, of that. And I asked him, I said, you know, how, what role does faith play on a day like this? And he said, well, when I heard about this, I prayed, I prayed that the victims would be given grace and I prayed for help for me to lead the nation. And then I said, well, you know, Niebuhr also said that a statesman of faith um, actually uh, has to choose between the lesser evil often. And he just ran off on that. I mean, we were there to talk about all these other things. We were actually flying in to talk about an agricultural conference in Ames the following week. And we, of course, asked questions about that. But once we got into this faith side, he just, I, I think at that point, Kevin was kind of like, let's get off this, you know, <laughs> I've got all, but he wanted, and he, he quoted Max Weber. He said, oh, the statesman of faith risks his soul. And he talked about legislation that he had liked, but he couldn't stomach some of it, but he went ahead and signed it anyway. And it just was a topic that was very interesting to him and engaged him. And this was all pre-Lewinsky and, uh, you know, it, it, in retrospect, there's so many interesting aspects about it. And then people would question his Christian faith and stuff and with, with some reason. But it, it, to me, I, I got more out of that interview um, learning about a politician who struggles with all kinds of issues. And so that was the time where we both were there. I, Kevin got great stuff. He sent it back right away. And I did too. We both got on our mutual six o'clock news that night. Uh, I think we went back on the same plane. Um, we didn't hang out that night yeah. at a bar. We just, we did not do that. Um, Let's talk a little bit about some of the roles that you had because you'd been a, a debate moderator. You'd interviewed presidents, as you said, in the White House or in your place or somewhere else. Which one of those roles, are they the same? And did you, did you ever feel intimidated in being in certain places? Did you feel more comfortable when you were, say, in your building or in a set you build as opposed to going to the Roosevelt Room for an interview? You know, I think I grew up feeling that people are people. I don't know, Dad inculcated that in me. And I think I had exposure to some pretty important people, you know, early on. So I never felt intimidated by people. Maybe, maybe location. Um, certainly the White House is daunting. So yeah, perhaps there, but once you get into conversation, you know, people are people. I felt like um, my first debate with WHO was flying out to Massachusetts. Uh, Dukakis was running that year. And so a station in Boston was doing a debate and they invited me out pre caucuses to participate in that. And so that was one of my first introductions to a fairly largely watched debate. And uh, then we did debates in Iowa. Um, I remember one debate with uh, Bill Reichart was actually running for governor. He was running for the Democratic primary uh, against Bonnie Campbell. And we, did, we had a debate between Bonnie Campbell and 
Dick Reich, or Bill Reichardt. And Reichardt asked me before the debate, now, what questions are you going to ask? <laughs> and I, I said, no, no, Bill, that's not how we do this. Um, you know, this is, uh, this is not the way you do a, a debate. Anyway, um, I felt all along that I appreciated anchoring, but maybe debates were more fundamental to using my talents and skills. And the Republican debate of 99 was probably the one aspect of my career that will be a bit of a legacy. Um, and I, should I tell you about it right now? Well, yeah, and I, I know a little bit about this story, so I want to hear it from your perspective. Well, it, it, it turned into a legacy because it had an impact. And it wasn't because I did a great job. It happened to be a question that prompted a response that had impact in newspapers and journals for months and then books. And I'll give you a couple of examples. But what it was, it was the Republican debate in December of 99 before the 2000 caucuses. And it was on MSNBC and Tom Brokaw co-hosted it. And the two of us moderated this debate. And so I flew out to New York to meet with Brokaw to see, you know, how we're gonna approach this debate. And Tom, who, who over my career was very, very helpful and, you know, a bit of a hero. But Tom said, you know, John, you have all these stilted formal debates. Let's just open this up. Let's make this really freewheeling. We've got six candidates that are gonna be up there. Let's just go at it. We'll be in front. We won't sit down. We'll just move from candidate to candidate. We'll let conversations lead the way. We may start with foreign policy and then maybe we'll go to domestic policy, but there won't be set subjects. We're just going to be freewheeling and make this thing interesting. And I'm going, yeah, easy for you to do. <laughs> I'm dealing with Iowa news. You want to have a freewheeling debate with these guys like that? So that became very intimidating. Uh, I didn't tell Tom that, but <laughs> I, I thought, oh my gosh. So, you know, I prepped and prepped and prepped. But then what came out of that debate was the question that I asked George W. Bush among the six. In other words, I ran down the list of all six candidates. I was able towards the end of the debate to start with Steve Forbes and go down the line. And George Bush was third and responded to what political philosopher or thinker do you most closely identify with and why? And of course, everybody had said the fathers of our country, Thomas Jefferson, uh, Locke, some said, well, Bush says Jesus Christ. And that's it. Jesus. And then I say, well, I, I think our viewers would want to know how he becomes this most important political philosopher to you, because Bush had said Jesus Christ because he changed my heart. So my best response at that point, and that was all he said, he, he just kind of stopped short at that point. And I was caught a little bit surprised. So I said, I think our viewer want to know how he has changed your heart. And Bush came back with, well, if they don't know, then it's going to be hard to explain. But I gave my heart to Jesus Christ, my Savior, and he changed my life and he changed my heart. Now, this is 99. And this is a time when Bush eventually won the caucuses and then won the presidency in large part by appealing to evangelicals. And the response that came right after, and I've got, you know, I have to refer to certain, I don't want to misquote, but the types of things that were written, Hannah Rosen of the Washington Post said, it's becoming known as campaign 2000's uh, Christ moment. 
Howard Feynman of Newsweek wrote, I think it was an extraordinary moment where secular politics and religious faith intersected. Um, Maureen Dowd took a typically sarcastic view and accused um, Bush of playing the Jesus card when I asked, you know, how he's changed your heart. She said, well, it's going to be hard if you don't know. He said he was, she said he was playing the Jesus card. Um, and Dick Morris of Clinton White House fame uh, was bold enough to say on Fox, Governor Bush cut right into the evangelical vote and thought it was going to be hugely successful. Well, anyway, this played out in various ways for, for several months. And then it actually played out in books afterwards. And I've thought back to the influence of that. And for me, it was interesting because here I was, you know, I'd been a seminary student. I understood where he was coming from, but I also felt that that's not necessarily the time in a political debate to use your faith to perhaps procure votes, which is what mainline church officials actually in Iowa responded with. And yet in, here's a book, George Bush's memoirs, decision points, he writes about that debate. And his dad called him right afterwards and said, you know, I, I don't think that that answer is, is gonna hurt you. And W said, what answer? <laughs> And the dad said, uh, the Jesus answer. <laughs> and so he goes on to say yes. And then I won the, uh, won the caucuses. And then this book, uh, David Aikman was a former senior correspondent for Time Magazine. He decided to write A Man of Faith. And it was about George Bush. And at the very start of the book, the Greater Des Moines Civic Center, a large, crisply modern con. He takes the whole, the very start of the book is the scene of that, that debate. And then he goes through and, and tells the story. So to me, it had more impact than anything else I did in my career. And it also intersected a bit with my background. I didn't expect it. I really was not going in that direction as I had with Clinton. Uh, but it became that and became fascinating to me. And then I could use that experience to speak to churches and, and public service organizations about the intersection of church and state and where I come from, which is a bit different than the way George Bush came from. And what has now resulted is this growing influence and division with the evangelicals and the more moderate mainline church. And you could say that this was almost a tipping point. So I'm not being as articulate as I should be, but I know that um, that will be the most significant aspect of my career. I wanna get back to politics in a moment, but you've been holding up a lot of books. How come you have not held up your books? <laughs> They're out of print. <laughs> <laughs> I have one of them. I think it's upstairs. Um, you wrote, I, I believe, a book of, uh, it not is poetry the right way, or, or do you call yeah, it prose? Reflections. They're not quite poetry, but they're they're kind of arranged like poetry. They're reflections, meditations. Yeah, I, I tried to relate my two backgrounds, and I, I'm convinced that real experiences, news events can be kind of a prism of what God's presence is like in, in our world. And you have to face it one way or the other, you know, the, the tragic and the joyous. And, and if you don't, then, uh, then you're separating your faith from your real life. So it was also in part to encourage, you know, pastors to go ahead and in their prayers, even in their sermons, uh, relate the two because people are, they may spend a week dealing with something and then they go to church and, uh, and it's not even related to them. Mm -hmm. um, in church. And so I, I just was kind of hoping that I could encourage that. So I wrote two books that are very similar in the news tonight and then beyond the facts. And they're, they're similar in the beyond the facts one has some scripture verses to go with the news events, but they're all news events. And then I, you know, we don't have time when we're covering news to reflect on anything like that. We're, we're desensitized by the moving events. 
And so it was also for, gave me an opportunity to just sit down when I wrote these, just sit down and, and reflect on the events that I, the kind of thing I couldn't do in a newscast. But, you know, news has changed in the sense that, well, go back to, you were talking about Dave Shea writing editorials, uh, Grant Price wrote editorials, um, then they went away for a number of years. And now you're starting to see the anchors, maybe not the anchors, but the stations come back with them. And opinion ends up being outside the news after sports, before Wheel of Fortune, you're seeing those views. Has that been good for news? Well, I, I'm more concerned with the shows that are just total opinion and people get confused. They think they're new shows. And even though the networks still have their half hour news broadcasts where there aren't intended to be opinions, um, people mix the opinionated shows with those newscasts and so they say i can't i I won't watch anything i don't believe anything Mm -hmm. so they they it's a blanket whitewash of even news programs not so much on the local level uh fortunately but yes if you if you put the editorial afterwards you know i i think that's okay a quick story about walter cronkite i asked him i interviewed him after he had retired and spent about an hour with him. And this topic came up because he told me that his superiors wanted him to do editorials. And he resisted, you know, if if you're not old enough, Paul, but um, back in the day, um, there were pieces of elucidation, they called them done within a newscast or analysis but not really opinions. Eric Severide Mm -hmm. always bragged about, you know, just kind of analyzing the news. Well, they were kind of opinions. And Cronkite told me, I knew that I could do it. I could separate, I could do my opinion piece and separate it from the news. But I didn't think the audience would accept me reading the news if I were also doing opinion pieces. And, you know, I think he saw ahead to where we stand today now. I mean, he saw that people are not going to accept that. They don't believe that a newsman can do that. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, a a state of journalism, which is also, I wanna go back to politics here to wrap things up. Uh, Did you see your role as, whether it's the moderator or the anchor of the newscast in Des Moines, where all these candidates would have their caucus night events and and all this national circus came to town? What was, how did you view your role and what your station's role had to be in covering those candidates up into and including caucus night? I thought my role was just to try to get them to open up as much as possible about the type of administration that that they would would run and where they were coming from. Um, It certainly wasn't to judge one way or the other. It was it was just to have them be as open as possible. And, you know, we just don't have that now. And there's so much misinformation. And I mean, I I know you don't want to go into that in depth, but, you know, with private equity groups owning stations and with all the technology and the social media and the fragmentation and the deregulation and everything, people don't trust the media anymore. And with good reason, because they're all doing more with less. They don't have the money, they don't have the audience. So they're aiming at one particular audience and people do not know how to verify or check anything that sent them. I really believe, I'll get off my soapbox, but I think in high school, there should be a journalism 101 course for everybody on how to be a reporter, how to be a fact checker. It doesn't take hardly anything. You can go to factcheck.org. You can go to politifact.com. They're both good. And you can check and you can verify. And if people pass along all of these things that are not sourced, and are not verified, it just builds poison and spreads it. So that, that's kind of where we're at. Okay. All right, John, it looks like uh, 
we have come to the end of our time as I have lost your video, but that is okay. And uh, I appreciate your time. And this has been an interview for the Archives of Iowa Broadcasting on this, the 26th day of October. My thanks to John Bachman for joining us. Thank you so much.